So, the Bravely Default series are some games that I've really enjoyed up to a point. The heavy customizable combat allows for some creative, if not downright busted gameplay, and it makes for some entertaining games. But both of the 3DS games relied very heavily on some uh, conventional gaming breaking situations in order to accomplish its true endings to both of their stories. And both times kind of catching me a little bit off guard, which ended up leaving me feeling a little bit more bitter towards these two games. More specifically with the second one, though the first one certainly did do something pretty frustrating in its own right. But much like the secret but not really masochist that I am, I guess these games' stories do something kind of interesting if you can look past the way it abuses me. So to that end, when it came to Bravely Default 2, I wanted to make sure that I gave it as much attention as possible so that way I could basically giga brain any nonsense that I think it could try to pull on me this go around. So I played through it and what did I think? Well, that's what we're here to discuss. So today we're going to take a look at Bravely Default 2. So, Bravely Default 2 stars you as Seth, a sailor who gets swept up by the sea after an accident. He washes up on the shore of... Uh, hold on. Ah, uh, uh, it's... Condon's called Excellent? Excellent? Okay, maybe they've mentioned it. They hardly ever bring it up ever again. Usually they only kind of mention the land based off the major settlement of each respective region, so that's kind of how I've always interpreted everything else. So, Seth washes up on Halcyonia, where a young lady named Gloria and her retainer, Sir Sloane, help him out. Gloria is on a quest to recover the four major crystals of the elements after the invading Holograd forces laid siege and eventually destroyed her home of Musa. Through various events, Seth also encounters travelers Elvis and Adele, whom are recruited by Gloria to aid her on her quest to recover the crystals, and to also collect the various asterisks scattered about the land to aid Elvis in his quest to unlock the secrets of his late teacher's special book. So Bravely Default 2's overarching plot is pretty mundane, especially compared to the others, rivaling Bravely Default 1 in its simplicity pretty much all the way to the end. You know, collect the crystals to save the world, pretty much. But what Bravely Default 2 does a bit different than the other ones, though, is actually having some interesting set pieces to actually acquire the crystals. One has you dealing with some intense political and personal feelings with its villain. One has you dealing with some pretty creepy kidnapping and possession type situations. Another one has an honest to god Salem Witch Trials clone, which I thought was really interesting. All those subplots I thought were the game's strong point. But as soon as the crystal is recovered, there's really nothing left to it but to just move on to the next area. There are some side quests, some of which are fully voiced with true character development, but these didn't really feel all that special either. And I'll get it out of the way now, the voice acting is fine, despite the multitude of accents they got for it. It actually felt like a bit of a culture shock when one of the earliest parts of the game had a lengthy cutscene with a North American English accent one more of a posh British accent alongside a ye olden day English accent, Elvis's thick Scottish accent, whatever accent Adele is supposed to be, my apologies, I'm not sure, and some Australian thrown in there as well. The representation is nice for sure, it just scrambles your brain a bit trying to follow along sometimes. Musically, the game's got an alright, albeit somewhat limited soundtrack. The overworld, from what I can tell, is the same tune, just played with different instruments and beats depending on the area. Each of the major city themes are nice too, particularly Wizwaltz, I really like that one. But the best song has to go to the asterisk boss fight theme. Ah, oh, it freaking slaps. At least the early version of it. Partway through the game it tends to play a different theme and I don't know, it's just not as good as the OG. I even love the way it has a sort of prelude playing in the cutscenes 
that you usually play prior to the fight, then does a seamless transition from the prelude to the full theme when starting the fight. Ah, oh, it is super cool. Can't really say the same on the graphics though. I don't know man, but I really don't like the vast majority of the character models. Most characters' heads just seem a, a touch too large for their bodies, and the near plasticky look just kind of makes everything have too much gloss on them. The town backgrounds look pretty good using the same like oil painting type background image that the characters traverse on as with the other two games. The difference is that the overworld doesn't follow suit using a normal 3D rendering for the overworld. That's all well and good, but I do have a couple problems. Uh, my biggest one and most annoying problem is that the camera is an absolute rebel and will fight with you constantly. Not only that, but you can't even look remotely towards the horizon with it. It's practically stuck looking straight down at the ground. Now that's a problem when enemies are now encountered in the overworld, and say you come into a new area, if the enemies are high enough level, they'll aggro right to you and chase you down. It gets pretty irritating. There's also no actual special means of traversing the land like a boat or airship. You only have the one bulk landscape to explore, and you can fast travel to and from each major town. That's all well and good I suppose, but the lack of a vehicle in some capacity sort of stifles the adventure of the game. Well, that's not entirely true, I guess. There is a boat, but you don't ride in it. Early on, you rescue an old lady who rewards you with a boat that will go out while the game's not in use to collect items and money, which can be immensely helpful, especially if you get super lucky with the experience or job orb sizes. Other than that, you run around, collect treasures, visit shops, and the sort, you know, JRPG stuff. So let's talk about that combat. In the overworld, if you can get behind an enemy and strike it with a sword, or just strike with it in general, or whatever, you can get an advantage and be able to strike first with one extra brave point. As per its namesake, braving and defaulting are the integral part of its combat. As your turn comes up by an ATB gauge of sorts, you can either pick up to four actions in one turn to do, spending at least one brave point to do so, unless stated otherwise or you can default putting yourself into a guarding stance and stocking up one brave point. That is essentially the terms of engagement with the combat, something that both you and enemies can do. You can spend a few turns prepping your hardest hitter on their brave points, then have your party buff them up and have the hitter go all in with the brave points to dish out massive damage. The system means that characters are never not doing something productive in some capacity during fights. Healers, saboteurs, and synergists can keep themselves a bit safer while waiting to prep, or you can use brave points in an emergency if you need to. You can also go past your brave point limit in a sort of desperation move, putting you into the negative state for BP, making you unable to do anything until you're back even. While obviously bad, it too can be pretty good when grinding levels on weaker enemies, and you know you'll wipe the floor with the foe, so you can just go all in and move on. Despite sharing the namesake, braving and defaulting isn't the only major component to the combat. This is a job-based game after all, meaning you can pick one of a variety of unique jobs or classes for each of your characters to play as, inheriting the job's special quirks and abilities. You can also set up another job as a secondary that lets you use that job's unlocked abilities regardless of the main job. As you use a primary job in battles, you'll gain not only regular experience to raise base stats, but job experience with those level ups unlocking previously said abilities. And there's definitely a healthy variety of jobs to pick from. You can have a dragoon that casts magic, you can have tanks of all variety, multiple schools of magic, mixing and matching to your preference. The last two games did a good job with the job system, and this one only improves on it further. And while in combat, if you use your primary job's main abilities often enough, you can eventually charge up a special attack that starts to play a new tune that also buffs your entire party for as long as the song is playing, to which you can also chain together multiple songs to award more buffs as well as extend the overall time, which is a pretty sweet system. That being said, there's a few things that nag me a little about the whole thing. Firstly, and probably not as important to most, I'm very mixed about the designs of some of the jobs. Literal imagery is fine and all, but something like the Shieldmaster armor with literal fortress towers shoulder pads looks kinda dumb. The more modern update to some of the classic designs of things like the black and white mage are pretty good, but what the heck happened to the female design for the Thief and Ranger? I mean, 
sure the female thief kind of makes sense in like a, a female mobster from the 40s type of scenario. But if I'm ever lost in the woods and a ranger comes to me dressed like a cocktail waitress from the rich side of town, I'll assume the red berries I ate earlier are kicking in because I'd be hallucinating. Second, while the stats overall make sense and obviously making them higher is better, a new type of stat was implemented but I feel not executed very well. And that stat is the chance to be targeted stat. When I hear something like that, I think of MMOs and its aggro system. A perfect stat to apply to your tanky units. However, on top of every quote unquote better armor or weapon constantly raising that number anyways, it honestly felt like the stat didn't amount to anything. I made Seth my overall tanky person with as many points into the, into the stat as I can, but enemies just felt as likely, if not more so, to go for my Elvis for some reason. You're better off trying to have better evasion and speed for your squishier people. My last big thing is more exclusive to the early game and its bosses. My god, they counter literally everything. A frequent thing you'll see all throughout the game is enemies with counters to certain actions, whether it be attacks or specific techniques from jobs. As a standard thing throughout the game, it's fine, even if it is a little annoying, to have an enemy that has a counter to a specific weakness that it inherently has. Kind of makes weaknesses a bit redundant. The biggest offense, though, comes from the bosses in the early to mid game. Dear sweet god, the thief asterisk holder in particular had a counter for practically everything. You're only rocking a small handful of jobs, so experimenting in that sense is heavily punished. Buff as a bard? Counter. Try and attack? Counter. Default? Counter. Breathe? Counter. Sneeze? Throw mask on? Then counter. Ah, it's, it's frustrating early on since your options are so limited for jobs and actions and yet they counter practically every option makes building your own team feel somewhat punishing. You will eventually have the option to refight the asterisk holder in the end game, and if they had that plethora of counters then, I wouldn't be nearly as upset by it. And that's basically the gist of the combat to mention here. The final thing I want to mention is that for all you card game lovers out there, there is a game called B&D that you can play. It is required a little bit for the true story progression, but otherwise it's a thing. Obviously I played it to get the asterisk needed from it, but I didn't really get that invested into it, so I won't really butcher the explanation here. Sorry. And that's basically it. <laughs> I didn't I didn't really mean to have this huge like negative streak going on going into the ending of this, but in all honesty, Bravely Default 2 is a far better game than I really am making it out to be, despite all its early hiccups. Because once you get to the mid to late game, once your options start to open up to you and all that, it is a really solid game. And unlike the 3DS games, where all three have had that sort of unconventional game-breaking scenario going on to try to figure out its ending, this one has it, but it's not all that hard to figure out, and it's pretty simple to just keep progressing afterwards, making the whole ending a pretty enjoyable time. So, yeah, I guess I'm kind of like that, you know? It's... No matter the medium, if I don't enjoy your ending for whatever reason, no matter if I enjoyed everything else before it, I'm going to end up having a negative outlook on the whole thing, despite what however much fun I was having with the beginning of it. But Bravely Default 2 kind of proves the inverse of that. You know, I wasn't really having the best time at the very start, but then as the mid to late game came and I started to see the ending and all that, I kind of just overlooked the early problems and just enjoyed the whole time that I had with Bravely Default 2, making this a pretty solid RPG and, in my opinion, probably the best of the three. But anywho, thank you all so much for watching. If you like what you saw, you can click right up there to check out some of my other videos that I've done, or if you really feel like it, you can click right up there to subscribe. And also, if you want to check out the description, go towards my Twitter if you want as well to follow me there. That'd be pretty cool. And see when I upload stuff. And until next time, guys, I will see you all later.